actually my college freshman roommate, who I'm still uh, still good friends with. Uh, he used to do Ram, which was Race Across mm, yeah. America, That's super and I supported him, and it was oh, wow. uh, it was a pretty wild ride. He was <laughs> he's pretty excited to have me reaching out the window, feeding him little Dixie cups full of <laughs> whatever nuts and berries and whatever uh, whatever he thought was yeah. going to make him go faster. But that was an intense, uh, you know. Like I said, I've had some. I've been really blessed in my life and the experiences mm. that I've had, and that was a pretty great one because. Mm. It wasn't me performing at a high level. I just had to stay awake and mm -hmm. keep him fed. And it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you go across the country on your bike in ten days. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah, super intense. So, but yeah, yeah. That, so uh, there was a guy in the this documentary I was talking about who was he was a he was a ram racer and he was constantly in training for oh yeah uh, for that race. I think I forget if he had already participated in one ram before he did the Trans Am, but he was, um, he was like, you know, super athlete had, you know, yep. on the Trans Am bike race, he was only drinking, you know, some oh, yeah. special thing. <laughs> he wasn't eating regular food. Yeah. Yeah. My buddy, uh, he still does, uh, ultra marathons and things like that. So on mm -hmm. his birthday, he runs the number of miles that he's turning. <laughs> so we're 48. His yeah. birthday is like whatever, 20 days before mine. So, uh, I always text him on his birthday and ask him how his run went, and you know. <laughs> so he did 48 miles this year on his birthday. That's wild. Yeah. So wow. We'll see when that starts coming back downhill. Yeah. But he was. Uh, we played <laughs> football together um, in college, so he was a linebacker and he weighed about 230, 200 and whatever mm. pounds. And now he, at his running weight right now, he's he's about 160 pounds or so. Wow. It's crazy. That's wild. So, but yeah. yeah, superior athlete. So you so you hiked the Appalachian Trail back in the late nineties, you're saying? Yep. Yeah. Uh finished uh I got out of college. I wanted to get my college loans paid off. So I was working in the Hamptons as a landscaper hmm. and uh <clears throat> ended up working for someone. I put an ad in the paper to be their their gardener or their caretaker, hmm. or whatever, in exchange for rent. So I didn't have to pay rent in the Hamptons, which makes a lot of sense. Hmm. And then one day they said, How many hours a week are you working for the other company? And I said, ah, about 80 hours a week. And then I was working 10 hours for them on <laughs> Sundays. So I was working like 90 to 100 hours weeks. And they said, well, how much are you making? And I told them. And they said, well, how about if you work for us for 40 hours a week? And uh, we'll pay you the same amount. <clears throat> I said, OK. <laughs> so then uh, I said, the problem is I don't work a 40-hour week very well. So uh, can I you know, work more hours and make more money? And they said, you can work as many hours as you want. So I... Uh, I just hmm. put put my nose down, and so by the end of the summer, I had made wow. almost all of my college loans back, and then uh, decided <laughs> I wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail so it fit in. I uh, my girlfriend at the time was working at the Clam Bar in New York City and uh, Grand Central Station, so I said to her, "I'm gonna go uh, take a little walk," and uh, sure enough, I did. So I started August 30th and finished January 12th. Um, and up until that point, I wasn't a really confident uh, person. Hmm. Um, you know, went to school with people with a lot of money and really smart. And hmm. it was really tough. And then when I experienced that, uh, because I was the last 800 miles I hiked, uh, eight, uh, the last 812 miles I hiked uh, about 10 miles with somebody else. Hmm. So I was going, uh, the longest I went was four or five days without seeing another human being. And it's kind of funny if you're in Antarctica, you know, obviously negative five degrees isn't a big deal. But when you're hiking in, hiking in, <laughs> in Tennessee and all of a sudden it's negative five degrees, you're like, what in the hell's going on here? You know, I got to Georgia the first night I spent in Georgia. It was uh, nine degrees and the wind was blowing like hell. Hmm. And uh, I was like, where in the hell are the peaches at? <laughs> I'd never been to Georgia before. I'm just looking for peach trees, you know. I was freezing my ass off, but... Anyway, um, what it made it do was I completely learned how to, you know, really rely on myself mm. and um, you had to find water. So then the second long trip I did was out on the PCT and the AT combined. Um, mm. And I did that. Uh, I was in the desert by myself. And it was really wild because I hate the heat. I absolutely mm. hate the heat. I'm not looking forward to 85 <laughs> degrees or whatever it's going to be later this week. So in the middle of the desert, I started March uh, March 20th or so, 
And uh, I was a month ahead of the through hikers that go th up the PCT, usually mm. start around April 20th, because that way you can get through the desert before it gets too hot and your water supply goes away. But then you also have to deal with the High Sierra. Mm. So you have to wait for the snow to melt. This year they're going to have a hell of a time getting through the High Sierra because mm. there's just so much snow out there. Mm. So anyway, I was in the desert by myself, and there was times that I'm pretty sure I was 30 miles away from the next human being. Wow. You know, so when you're 30 miles away in the middle of the desert by yourself, um, A, you learn a lot about yourself. This was right when cell phones were coming on, so I had this really terrible cell phone, and there was no coverage anywhere, so it didn't really matter. So um, it was a really, really intense uh, situation, but it was, it was much like on the East Coast being a negative five degrees, you got to make sure you got water. Yeah. You know, and if your water's froze up or there's no water around, um, same thing as when you're in the desert. So you got to really uh, pay attention to what you're doing. Out west, there's a lot of trail angels because there's very few shelters on the PCT. Mm. So you're out in the middle of the desert. You have no, there's nothing. I mean, it's you and sand. Mm. You know, you hike across the Mojave mm. uh, in the dark. You follow the, aqueduct, the aqueduct yeah. under the ground. It's just a big concrete uh, yeah. thing you're walking on. And you can hear the water in the aqueduct, <laughs> but there's no <laughs> water that you can actually get to. So it's, it's pretty intense, but mm. being out there by yourself, like I got about three weeks in on both trips and your mind just starts going crazy places mm. because you just, your brain wants to work. It wants mm. to learn and wants to think, or at least mine does. Mm. So you're out there and you're not having any conversation with anybody. So you're having this, these deep conversations with yourself and you have the most effed up dreams because you're like, all of a sudden you're in a plane and every kid that you graduate with is on the plane with you, even though you haven't thought about them in mm. 15 years. Yeah. But vividly, you you see every every person's face. Wow. So, I don't know. Mm. That's uh, that's that's what hiking <laughs> long distances by yourself. Uh, it's it, I strongly recommend it to anybody. Yeah. You know. That's wild. So yeah, there's you, there's the Appalachian <laughs> Trail story in a nutshell. <laughs> Did but. you grow up in a family with like parents or anybody that like did that stuff? Yeah, we uh, we would go into the Adirondacks uh, for a week long vacation, hike in, hike around. Um, it's kind of funny because I've yet to hike any of the forty six peaks. <laughs> which is pretty wild because I've been on the top of Mount Whitney, mm -hmm. you know, out in California, which is the highest point in the continental U.S. Yeah, I've been I've walked literally thousands of miles. Um, hmm. A lot of that by myself. Uh, so it's a wild, uh, wild thing that I've yet to, yeah, <laughs> yet to hike up a, a single uh, <laughs> of the high peaks. <laughs> I um, <clears throat> years ago I decided it was actually like a year or two into this. I was just getting burned out on having my cell phone on all the time and having yeah. to respond to questions. And I was at a friend's house one night, and my phone just kept going off over something. And it was like I don't know, a nine o'clock on a Friday night. And, uh, or no, I'm sorry. It was like, it was a weeknight. I think it was a Tuesday, but anyways, I was just so burned out that I was like, I'm either going to throw this phone into the fire or I, I just need a break. And so I had seen white face mountain on Instagram posts, not, didn't know how far away it was or anything. I just knew I need to get to the top of white face yeah. mountain. So I just jumped in my car. It was, you know, drove up pitch black. It was early spring, uh, drove up there. Found a got a, got a hotel for the night. Uh, got up there at like one in the morning, two in the morning, something. Got a hotel. Woke up early the next morning. Drove to Whiteface, and I get there, and I'm you know you're going through the gate and, um, and paying to get up there, and they're like, hey, you can't go to the top. It's like covered in fog and snow and ice. And so I was like, okay. I was like, can I drive? Can I at least drive up as far as I can? And I drove up there, and uh, they're like, you can get up there. So I drove up as far as I could. And uh, got out. You couldn't see anything. I mean, you couldn't see four feet in front of your face because yeah. of all the fog. Everything was covered in ice. You know, it was like seventy degrees down in the village, and it was you know five degrees up at the top yeah. of the mountain. Uh, but I was up there for like I don't know, maybe an hour, and <clears throat> nothing. And it's just it's what I needed. And then yeah. I drove back home oh, yeah. to Syracuse. You know. Yeah, when I did the uh, AT. Uh, Coming southbound, I started on Katahdin. It was like 85 degrees mm -hmm. in, eight, in the end of August. 
And people, the locals are like, oh, my God, we were all dying. And then the opposite, when I got down south, it was mm. negative five, and the people down south were just like, what is going on here? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild to uh, be out there. So when we were coming down through Vermont, we were following the frost, basically, mm. and the foliage. Well, we kept every place we went, people were talking about, oh, when you get to the top of this mountain, you get to the top of the mountain. So we had nine days straight of rain and fog. <laughs> I did not see any views in Vermont whatsoever. It was the funniest thing. So, but then, you know, you get out in California when you're hiking out in California and out west, and, you know, you're just above tree lines so much and you can see so far. Mm. That's the difference between the two trails is the AT. Um, some people call it the amateur trail because there's so many road crossings and there's so many shelters and everything. Mm -hmm. But for me, the AT was harder physically mm. than the PCT because they have the PCT is graded for pack stock. Mm. I don't know what the grade is, but it's only like 8% or something like that, mm. which is kind of tough mentally because you can see above tree line, like especially when you're in the desert, because mm -hmm. there's like desert and then there's like some trees and then you get. Mm. above the tree line so you can see the trail mm. and you know the point <laughs> and it's like 10 miles away to get to the top of that mountain and you can see the switchbacks oh, wow. and you're just like son of a bitch why don't we just go <laughs> up the mountain so that was the tough part about coming southbound too is in maine and new hampshire it's mm -hmm. like a rock scramble mm -hmm. then you get to vermont and they do switchbacks mm. and you're just like this is a lot easier climbing than do what you're doing in new hampshire and maine but that's wild. The whole thing's a mental thing. You yeah. know, physically, I think that just about anybody. I mean, I was out there with, there's like 12-year-old kids that have done the AT. There's like 80-year-old hmm. folks that have done the AT. Yeah. So the mental part of it, hmm. you know, the last uh, the last uh, three and a half weeks, just about a month, I either put my feet in wet or frozen boots every morning. And when I'm talking frozen, like I'm talking – kind of jump off the lean-to to get my feet wedged in my boots and then hike for like <laughs> two or three miles to warm the boots up so you can relace your boots, you know? And it's uh, it's like walking with cinder blocks, you know, <laughs> concrete blocks on your feet. But, man, that those are wild. the days. That is I'd wild. do it again in a second, man. Yeah. I'd, oh, man, I'd love to go do another long, long hike. Yeah. So that's the problem with farming is there's not a whole lot of time <laughs> for doing, you know, five-month hikes. How did you get into farming? How did I get into farming? Well, the story goes, when I was about three years old, so long story, really long, uh, I was on the way before my parents were out of high school, so my dad went in the Marines. Okay. Uh, we went all over the world, Japan. My brother was born in Okinawa. Hmm. My dad actually uh, watched the Russians or listened to the Russians. He hmm. was you know, sitting there listening, just like we are on these microphones, to <laughs> whatever was going on around the world. Uh, that was right at the tail end of the Vietnam War, so there was a lot of that stuff going on. Hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, came back to central Pennsylvania. My dad went into the Marines to pay for college, came back to central Pennsylvania. He went to Penn State. Um, my both sides of my family have strong farming backgrounds. Um, my uh, my grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great and whatever um, actually owned the uh, eastern end of the Nittany Valley, hmm. the Penn State Nittany Lions, yeah. the Nittany Valley. Um, so that's pretty cool. Hmm. Um, so that was where it started was um, when we came back to Pennsylvania, uh, we had a trailer uh, on my father's parents' uh, farm. And uh, my dad has grown just about anything you can grow in central New York. Hmm. So I've seen just about everything. You know, I mean everything. Tobacco, hardy kiwis, bananas. Really? All kinds of crazy stuff that you'd never know could grow here. Wow. Um so uh, that's where the farming comes from. So when I was three years old, my dad used to get the penny packets from Burpees or Gurneys mm -hmm. or one of those seed catalogs, and they'd always have some big goofy bean in there or something <laughs> that you're like, ah, oh, what's this going to turn into? <laughs> so my brother and I would plant our rows of seeds amongst my dad's garden, and uh, that's where it started. Hmm. I mean, I was really lucky. I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I wanted to grow something hmm. uh, from a very young age. When I was 10 years old, we moved to Cato. Um, <clears throat> I grew up on a small farm in Cato, not the farm that I farm now. Um, I had a bigger garden by the time I was 10 or 11 years old than most people did, you know, most people <laughs> have now. And it was really just the leftovers from my dad's garden or <laughs> seeds. I'd like 
rifle through his seed packets and then you know, I get my ass beat for uh, you know stealing whatever seeds out of his collection of, of seeds. But uh, that's where it really started. I growing up my my brother is just like my dad and I'm just like my mom, except mm. for the plant thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, my dad and I have a lot of really intense conversations on Sunday mornings about plants and what's growing and what's not growing and what this and that. And mm. did you see this variety and, mm. you know, whatever crazy stuff. So he does a lot of seed saving for me too. Cool. I just don't have the time cause you know, running the farm, running a farm can, can take <laughs> up a little bit of your time. Um, so he does a lot of stuff like that. Like, you know, last year we had 120 varieties of tomatoes alone available, uh, to people as plants. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, probably hmm. three quarters of those are heirlooms. Um, so we, we save a lot of seed from the heirloom seeds. Hmm. Um, that was something when I was in, in high school, uh, my dad used to grow watermelons, moon and star watermelons for one of the seed companies for the seed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was when they were getting ripe was right around double sessions for football. <laughs> so we'd, my brother and I would carry watermelons in and then in between <laughs> sessions, you know, we'd have two hours in the morning and, you know, an hour or two in between then yeah. two hours in the afternoon or whatever for practice. And uh, everybody's just feeding their faces. And the only thing was they had to spit the seeds back in the, uh, back in the cup. So yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of funny, funny how, how those things happen. But anyway, that got my, uh, you know, the diversity that we've always had at Wiley Fox Farm is a, dr a direct result of my dad being like, hmm. why the hell wouldn't you grow kiwis if you can grow them? Wow. Why the hell wouldn't you grow 50 different varieties of tomatoes or hmm. apples or whatever? So, so that's really where it got started. And then, uh, like I said, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, by the time I was 13 years old, I was like saving my own seed and just... Hmm going to all these like Ontario orchards up, mm -hmm. you know, up in Oswego. Oh my God. That was like, you know, I was begging to go there. <laughs> Let's go see what they got. Let's go see what they got. Yeah. Let's go to, you know, and then I spend all my allowance on, uh, on plants at <laughs> Ontario orchards. But, uh, then, um, you know, then I got serious about, well, geez, I guess I should go to school for this. Hmm. So, um, I also played football. I did really well as a high school football player. And then uh, ended up being recruited uh, by some big programs and little programs and everything in between. And I ended up at Cornell. Um, mm. I did not have the grades. I do not test well. Mm. It's kind of funny because I can remember everything about 120 varieties of tomatoes on Memorial <laughs> Day weekend when people are screaming and yelling and <laughs> fighting and whatever else in my booth, which is a whole other <laughs> story. But, uh, <clears throat> but I can't, I couldn't. Um, I had a reading comprehension. So I mm. got to Cornell, I'm competing with people that got 1600 on their SATs. Mm. And it turns out through the Huntington Learning Center, I found out that I was had a reading comprehension level of about a ninth or 10th grade wow. student. So, uh, so football, I'm one of those jocks that got mm -hmm. into college because <laughs> I was a dumb jock. Uh, the good news about this story is I figured out the learning disability. I ended up graduating with honors after they tried to flunk me out. Wow. So I really turned it around and, uh, <clears throat> you know, a life lesson there is, you know, you just, you can't ever give up. Hmm. There's been a few setbacks in, in my life personally. You know, one of those was that where you get the Cornell and the first introduction was because I didn't get above 500 on my, um, reading you know, the verbal, whatever they call it, yeah. the, the English part of your SATs, yeah. um, they make you take <clears throat> a test. So here I am sitting in this like big lecture hall, hmm. two or 300 kids or whatever, taking this test. And uh, I got to be honest, I didn't understand the question. Hmm. Like, how do you write four pages in an hour about something that you don't even know what the fuck they're asking you? <laughs> so then, uh, you know, the remedial English uh, guy you know, as who he was the head of the program. And he, if I ever write a book, it's going to be dedicated to him because that's what he asked me. Hmm. I walked in the room, he looked at the paperwork and he said, did you even understand the question? <laughs> that was my introduction to Cornell. <laughs> You're about to get your ass handed to you. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, then I uh, figured out the learning disability thing. And uh, so my, the beginning of the school was really rough. Freshman year was a rude awakening, and I just, it didn't matter. The first semester, 
I got right at the C minus D plus mm -hmm. uh, mark, like a one six seven or something like that. I think is the cutoff one seven maybe. So I think I got like a one seven two or something. And then the second semester, I took exactly the same courses when I got home for Christmas and got my grades. My parents were like, come on, you're a smart guy, figure this out, mm -hmm. stop drinking so much, whatever. I was like, I don't really feel like I was drinking too much. I was mm -hmm. getting my ass handed to me. And then the second semester, I studied my ass off. Mm -hmm. Like, wasn't drinking, wasn't doing nothing. I was just doing football and school. Yeah. Working out all the time in school. And uh, I got like a 164. Whatever the cutoff is, mm -hmm. I was just above it and I was just below it. Mm. And I came home and I was like so upset when I got my grades. And then I took it upon myself to go over to, they just had one in Fayetteville, the Huntington Learning Center. Mm. And I went in there and they tested me. It was like the simple three paragraphs on the Egyptian pyramids. Mm. I couldn't answer the questions. Mm. I couldn't answer half. The, I just read the passage. Yeah. I could not answer half of the questions. Huh. So, uh, so yeah, that was, that was kind of a big deal. That's why I'm... <laughs> I'm kind of, I mean, I was, I was, I grew up in a, uh, my parents it, were all, we all grew up Christian, but, um, and everybody still is, but my parents definitely back then, they were, they had a different take on kind of life and Christianity than they do today. Mm -hmm. And so we were all, all me and I'm, I'm the youngest of four, but we were all homeschooled. Oh yeah. But, and, uh, my sister all the way through high school. And then she went off to Bible college, and now she's a traveling minister. Cool. Uh, my two brothers went to a really small Christian school when they were in ninth and eighth grades. But uh, my other siblings are so close in age, and even though this makes zero sense, but it does sort of make sense, my other siblings were so close in age that my mom taught them the same subjects and the same level at the same time. Yeah. But I was so much younger. I'm, you know, four years younger than my next brother, so five, six years younger than the rest. But uh, um, actually, ten years younger than my sister. But anyways, that she couldn't teach me, you know, fourth grade math when yeah. I, you know, so, yeah. um, so <clears throat> as a result, my mother, if she ever listens to this, is going to murder me. Uh, as a result of that, I didn't. I had zero education. Yeah. Like up until, like by the time that I entered the ninth grade, I could barely read or write. I forget cursive or anything yeah. like that. Math for me was simple addition and subtraction, and that's all I knew. Yeah. Uh, there was no history or English classes or anything like that. And then I got tossed into, I did one year when we lived in Kentucky of that same small Christian school. And then we moved here to New York, to Syracuse. And um, because of the Regents exams, I had to repeat my ninth grade mm -hmm. year. And because uh, Kentucky didn't have stand, you know, sure. state testing like New York does. So, so really, I had like one year of like podunk Kentucky <laughs> Christian education, <laughs> that, where I was able to take a history class instead of a foreign language, <laughs> you know, in yeah. Kentucky, to you know, uh, New York State public school system. Yeah. So that was kind of that was a that was a whirlwind for oh, sure. I bet I definitely was able to, and and probably that's it's one of the reasons why I'm good at what I am today and, you know, also maybe one of the reasons why I'm not as determined in some things as I should be today, but I was able to talk teachers in high school into yeah. a lot, you know, yeah. like, oh, yeah. oh, are you sure? Are you sure? Maybe yeah. I should get that extra yeah. five points and just pass this one, you know? <laughs> um, so I couldn't add, but I couldn't, I could, but I could talk my teachers in anything yeah. I wanted to. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, charm, charm, being charming will get you a long way. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. So, so uh, yeah. So I, I got out of out of college and uh, and headed down to Long Island of all places. I got uh, recruited to go do mm. landscaping, which was amazing. I was working like like I said, a hundred hour weeks, mm. and uh, we were planting these huge trees. Mm. And my boss was like happy that he had a right hand man that mm. that could do just about anything or learn just about anything. And he just totally put my crew on my shoulders mm. and he kind of like disappeared into the background. <laughs> so I was running, you know, these multi-million dollar projects where we were bringing literally one tree on a tractor trailer, like a 50, 60 foot tree Wow! and using big equipment. So I learned all kinds of big equipment, got my tractor trailer license and mm. uh, Spanish. I, <laughs> I uh, when I got to Long Island, um, back then, 
uh, you know, the borders were pretty easy, relatively easy to get back and forth. So guys would come up for like a year or two, go mm-hmm. back down, you know, like make the American money and send it back to Mexico or Ecuador or wherever. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what happened was I got the first day of work, I got put in this big truck with air brakes and uh, three Ecuadorian guys. And every time I stepped on, <laughs> on the brakes, we about went through the windshield because <laughs> air brakes are like you put your foot on the yeah. brake and you stop especially if you have an empty truck. So anyway, every time I stepped on the brakes, we'd go about go through the windshield and I'm grinding <laughs> the gears and these three guys are like back and forth. I can't understand a word. I've had had 4 years of, you know, Spanish but yeah. Uh, but w- until you're actually speaking with real Hispanic people right. in, you know, their language, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter how book smart you are or what the words were or whatever, but hmm. it was pretty wild because uh, you know, there I was had this big truck, three guys I couldn't communicate with, <laughs> and I was working on some, you know, million dollar <laughs> project or something. Wow. So you're just like, get thrown in real deep. And uh, by the time I left there, you know, a year and a half later to go start walking the AT, um, I wasn't, I'm not quite fluent in Spanish, but if you drop me in Mexico City, which I've been to Mexico City, <laughs> uh, I have no problem, you know, getting around. So it was a really cool thing to see um, instead of being like the other gringos just mm-hmm. screaming direction in <laughs> English and having them like not knowing what to do or pretending not, <laughs> not know what to do. I learned the language and it, <clears throat> it was a matter of uh, being with this. I took this young guy under my wing. He was only 15 or 16 years old. Mm. And uh, we just went down the street as we're driving saying, como se dice, como se dice, como se dice. And then... And then we started speaking, you know, he he was starting to speak a lot of English, and I was mm. speaking a lot of Spanish. And then when I moved out to California, uh, there's, a you know, obviously a big Mexican population out there. Yeah. Um, so at one point I was working on this big bajillion-dollar lighting job, you know, so we were working at night, fixing mm. the lights with the, with the designer. Mm. And then during the day we were working, actually getting things covered up or digging trenches or whatever we had to do to get the get everything ready for the night portion. Mm. So at one point I'm screaming across the uh, across the job site in Spanish into the darkness, and then you know the Mexican guy is screaming back at me in English. <laughs> so the designer looks at me and he says, "I've seen a lot of shit all over the world doing this job, but I've never seen where the white guy was screaming in Spanish and the Mexican guy was screaming back in English." That's so, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, but just a real uh, huge um, respect to uh, the farm workers and mm. and landscaping and hotel <clears throat> workers and all the people that are behind the scenes or yeah you know there's a whole political mm. we could talk I could talk about it that for an hour you know yeah. um, I think that there's a real bad rap uh, promotion of the negative aspects of whatever, stealing jobs and doing mm. this and drug lords and whatever. And yeah. my experience has been, <clears throat> I once at a town board meeting uh, where someone was, was was not interested in having uh, a neighbor uh, be a Hispanic, one yeah. of our workers. And uh, <clears throat> so there I said at the town board meeting and I said, you know what? I've been working with Hispanic migrant Mm-hmm. whatever workers for 25 years now hmm. and there's been about two people that I've had a real problem with and uh this week alone I've had at least two problems with white people that I was working hmm. with yeah. so you know American <laughs> white whatever you want to say yeah um so <clears throat> I believe that uh, most of the folks that are here are doing the same thing I'm doing with my life trying to make it better trying to provide for my family yeah I believe they are too um Hmm. It's uh, it's you know, like I said, it, it, we can go real political real quick on it. But <laughs> the basis for me is, uh, you talked about Christianity. Yeah, a lot of the guys that I've been working with recently go to church for four hours on Saturday night, hmm. and then they go back for the double take on Sunday morning. Yeah, you know, um, family oriented. Like I said, want a better life. Want hmm. all the things that I want. Yeah, you know, all sure. the things that my great great grandparents wanted when they came to this country. Hmm. So um, that's a that's a pretty important part of uh, of my philosophy for really the golden rule. You know, mm. treat everybody like you want to be treated. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got a bit of a nice guy complex. I want to, you know, <laughs> I'm a people pleaser, but really what it comes down to is, uh, hmm. I treat people the way that they, I want them to treat me. Yeah. And, uh, Sometimes the customers, they walk a fine line there. You know, we're at market. People are, uh, they want the same tomato plant or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's a different world. Oh, man, there. yeah. Consumer facing, yeah. I'll tell you, you want to see some crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff go down, come hang out in our market stand on Memorial Day weekend. Because that's when everybody thinks that they're allowed to plant. That's when the weather's going to be good enough, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, man, our market stand on, uh, on Memorial Day weekend uh, you see some crazy stuff, people huh. fighting and elbows and really, it's crazy, man. I'm not, wow. I'm not exaggerating. And then there I am just trying to be the bouncer, <laughs> keep everybody cool. And let's just get your plants in your garden. So. I, um, I've def- I want to, I want to learn more about the farm and, you know, and all that stuff, but yeah. uh, I will say I, I, I've been connected to the Abbott's, the Abbott farms out mm-hmm. in, uh, Beedo, oh, yeah. you know, they for do, a few Yeah, years. they do a hell of a job. Yeah. And um, so I've done their social media for a couple of years. And then last year they needed help with their, just with staffing in general, but with yeah. their, um, uh, their like they had built a cidery for their mm-hmm. hard cider. So yeah. I helped them and came on board and was running their bar for them last year. And then now I'm doing it again this year. Great. And it's definitely, it, it's, it's challenging, but I will say it's a, it's a wild, um, and now it's even less, but it's why it was Windsor who was, you know, Windsor's 88. Yeah. And then Warren, who's, yep. you know, in his 50s. Yeah. Yeah. I've met Warren a couple of times. I've done a couple of tours there. And okay. We've uh, sat on a couple of different like panels together okay. throughout the years for uh, cooperative extension and some yeah. other things. So Windsor and his wife now, you know, they just finally, they were living in the house on the pro. Now they're finally in a, in a, you know, assisted living home. But yeah. So now it's just Warren, really, yeah. and yeah. that entire property. And they've got a ton of land. Oh, yeah. Um, even though, you know, they're, they're doing, so they're doing pumpkin, corn, sunflowers, obviously lots of apples, blueberries, strawberries, and I think that's it now. Um, but it's still a ton of acreage that he's, you know, he's got, and, and then they've got some animals and whatnot. But anyways, they bring up, they have a family that's been there with them for the past, I think four years now in a row, at least, um, um, you know, migrant family mm-hmm. that's come up every year and spends the entire season. They just came up two weeks ago. They'll be here until, you know, October. Yeah. And it's them and Warren out there on the farm doing yep. everything. It's wild. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've I've left the bar at midnight on a Friday night, and I've seen Warren's headlamp across the, <laughs> after strawberry season, you know, building the strawberry beds Oh, man, right, in, right inside my door on the windowsill, there's about... Like literally right now, there's probably five or six headlamps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tree and I do a lot of work at night. Well, yeah. Especially I do. I love, love, love being out in the field uh, when there's no one else around and the mm-hmm. stars and like the whole thing. This morning, hmm. uh, we got so we let our chickens run wherever the hell they want from about November fifteenth or so until about April fifteenth when we start getting things in the greenhouse. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, like yesterday, we're <laughs> we're setting up one of the greenhouses and the chickens are right in there with us digging and carrying on. So this morning was lock the chickens up uh, day. So we have them, we have a really cool coop for them that I mm-hmm. built, and then there's like the movable fence. Yeah. Um, so the it's a chicken tractor, uh, so yeah. we can move it right down the way. And uh, so this morning I was trying to get the netting, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning, alarm goes off, I get up, I get out there (laughs) and this roll of fence, it's a pain in the ass to even do it when it's like right then and there and you're just moving it. Yeah. So then imagine it for the last five months, it started out in the (laughs) barn and then it ended up in a greenhouse and then it was outside and it's under something or whatever. So it just gets all tangled in itself. (laughs) So there I was this morning. The stars are beautiful. The chickens are kind of <laughs> clucking in the in the thing, wondering what the hell I'm doing outside. <laughs> and there I am wrestling this whole big ball of you know steaks and <laughs> netting. And <laughs> so all uh, part of the fun of being a farmer. So the headlamp they're yeah. a pretty important part of our business plan. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, speaking to that, uh, one of the one of the biggest things that has always been important is the quality of our produce and the quality of our seedlings. Mm-hmm. Um, and I pick a lot of greens between 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock in the morning mm. uh, for that purpose. When we when we pick them that early in the morning, especially in the summer when it's going to be warm, you pick them that early in the morning, you get them right into the cooler, <clears throat> and they'll stay in your refrigerator for, you know, three weeks. Yeah. You know, kale and 
lettuce and chard and all those all those greens, bok choy and yukina savoy and all the crazy stuff we grow. Yeah, I got some chard last summer and uh, yeah, I think it was last summer towards the fall. But anyways, I bought a bunch from you and I brought it home and I was like, most of the time when I go to the market, I'm I run around and I buy all this stuff. And I'm like, oh shit, I have to. I have to now eat all of this in yeah. the next few days. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, but that stuff stayed phenomenal. It didn't yeah. like in the fridge for about a week and a half before yeah. I cooked it all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, uh, it, it's always been high on the list. Like, why, you know, and I think that beca- that is a big part of like, you know, I'm not one of the OG uh, organic guys. You know, mm-hmm. like I learned from Dick DeGraff up at Grindstone. Like, okay. just that's where I interned love his family love the operation love love what they're doing what they have done all the things yeah um i i really wanted to go so let's say at cornell in 1994 i'm sitting there and in class and they bring up the slides of the organic oh this is what some people are trying to do ha 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 and i laugh just like along with everybody else and they show the like half rotten potatoes and the Mm -hmm. like holy greens and whatever (laughs) And I was like, fuck that. We can do this better. Yeah. You know? So uh so sure enough, when we started out, you know, our soil was like concrete. There was no mm. worms, like just it was terrible, you know, it was just terrible. Mm. And uh we've incorporated, you know, obviously uh, you know, cover cropping and manures and all that kind of stuff to get our soil about where we want it. Mm. Um but it's it's really interesting to see like when we first started putting out organic produce, people were like, oh, this can't be organic. This isn't organic. What are you spraying? Are you certified? Mm. Blah, 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 all this stuff. I used to set up at Nature Time back in the day on Bridge Street. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to have the the weight, the scale guy come to like certify our scale. Mm. And he said, you guys are organic? And I said, yeah. And it was, you know, it was right there on our sign and whatever. <laughs> and he, he was like, yeah, but there's, there's no holes in this. I'm like, it doesn't have to be holes in it. <laughs> Well, I've never seen organic produce like this. This can't be organic. What are you guys spraying? Are you spraying something? I said, uh, I've never sprayed a thing since we bought the farm. Hmm. Well, this can't be organic. This isn't, what do you, you know, are, you can tell me. And I'm like, <laughs> nothing, man. So something that I'm most proud of in my whole life is the fact that uh, since we've been farming in, on this farm, which this is our 20th year, hmm. pretty excited about that, wow. 2003 to 2023, uh, we have not sprayed a damn thing. That's wild. So our inputs for certification are our seed, mm-hmm. which are all either certified organic or untreated. Because we grow like 120 varieties of tomatoes, mm. I can't get all of those certified organic, but we can get them untreated. Mm. So what that means is it was grown po- probably conventionally, and a lot of times it's not even necessarily grown conventionally. They just aren't certified. Yeah. And that seed... Um, is what I'm putting in the ground and then raising it hmm. organically. So we have seed, we have our potting soil, which the potting soil that we use is uh, something that I helped develop hmm. um, uh, years ago. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. That's uh, and then we have our manures, which we get from all like kind of local farms, mm-hmm. no horse track manure that has hormones and all the. Yeah. antibiotics and all that stuff in it. Uh, and then we use, um, when we need to, which is usually about five gallons a year on the whole farm, is uh, Neptune's Harvest, which is a fish emulsion, uh, which is a little source of nitrogen. And what we do, usually we water with that before we put stuff out in the field. Okay. And it takes a little bit of the shock off of the plants mm. so that when they get in that good soil, they just take off instead of being in shock yeah. or uh, struggling a little bit. Hmm. So that's our four inputs hmm. for everything that we do. Wow. Um, which we're probably the only farm, especially of our size, in central New York. And there's probably not very many of us in the Northeast that can say that yeah. that's the four inputs that we've done. Hmm. So when I first started out, even in the organic, you know, the old school organic guys were like, you can't do that. Hmm. You aren't going to be able to do that. You can't sustain that. Hmm. You can't do, you know, you'll, you're, you won't you will have any crops. Hmm. And... Uh, you know, then on top of that, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough uh, thing because, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the, the whole organic movement hadn't really come to central New York, mm-hmm. you know. Um, there was a few of us getting started with CSAs and stuff like that. 
Hmm. And uh, so I had a lot of people that were like, you can't do that. Hmm. Why are you doing it organically? You know, my own dad. I yeah. love my dad to death. <laughs> but he was like, we could we could spray a little Roundup right over here. And, you could, <laughs> and I'm like, no, dad. No, that's not what we're doing. And then, uh, you know, I, a really good friend of mine, you know, like a brother, um, him and his family are conventional dairy mm. uh, folks. And he was just like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, this is the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why would you not use pesticides? Why'd you, why would you not use herbicides? And so uh, the first crop that we did was actually for a pumpkin maze mm. or a corn maze. And they had pumpkins that they slung out of the slingshot and all that kind of fun <laughs> stuff. So we were growing pumpkins the first year. This was June of 2006 or five, somewhere in there. And, uh, and we were having problems with vine borers, mm. which vine borers go in right at the ground. And mm. then they eat the, 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 yeah. Yeah. The tissues that make the water go up. <laughs> there you go. There's, there's my Cornell education at, uh, work right there. Uh, if you can't laugh at yourself, you shouldn't laugh at anybody. Uh, so anyway, um, it just it, it hollows out the, the yeah. vine until it kills it. So one day you have this beautiful pumpkin plant. The next day it looks like it's a little wilty from drought. Huh. And then like by day three or four, it's completely flat on the ground. Wow. Um, it's just because it's not getting any, any moisture anymore. So... Uh, the key to the, the the answer to this is to slit vertically the vine and pull it out because you mm. can see where they go in. There's usually a little bit of poop that's outside of the hole, so huh. you know where they are, and they're always above the hole. Huh. So you slice it with a razor blade and you pull it out when you see that first wilt. Yeah, there's the answer for your for your vine bore problem. But is it like an infestation, or is it like one or two? So per... what's interesting, it's one per. Uh, I've never seen more than one in a vine. Hmm. But it's also interesting is that they hit smaller, this is what I was told back then, and it seems to be true, smaller plantings of hmm. pumpkins and squash and stuff, which is perfect for the home gardener, or yeah. not perfect, I guess. Um, so anyway, we were having that trouble. So a friend of mine uh, worked on a research, a chemical research farm hmm. where they did organic testing and they did, you know, whatever, everything under the sun. Yeah. Um, so he's like, oh, here, this is something you can use for, uh, for you know, it's, you know, be certified organic and use this product. So I bought myself a backpack sprayer and uh, knelt down in front of my barn, and I was going to mix it, and I was reading the directions, and it said, this could be hazardous if, or this is going to hmm. irritate your eyes if, and blah, 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 all, these, all these things. And I, right then and there, on our first crop, luckily, hmm. I read that package, and I was like, why the hell would I use this? Yeah. Like, this is kind of the opposite. And also, like, I don't really ever want to be a hypocrite mm -hmm. in my life. Um, so I was like, this doesn't make sense. So I, like, literally never mixed the mm. package. I still have that back spray, backpack mm. sprayer here almost 20 years later mm. that's never been used. Wow. It's hanging in my barn. <laughs> I bring it out every year for Fox Fest. <laughs> we have our big end of the season party, and I give the little speech, and I say, this is the backpack sprayer that never got anything mixed into it. Huh. So from that point forward, uh, that was the rule. Yeah. You know, like, why are we going to use things that you can use, but... It's still really hazardous. Yeah. And, you know, once once organic became a big multi-bajillion dollar thing, then everybody and their brothers, like, you know, trying to talk to their congressmen and whatever and mm. lobby to get things accepted and unaccepted and whatever. And uh, it's just not, it's not part of what we need to do. Mm. You know, and there's there's still dangerous things on my farm. I mean, diesel fuel, yeah. gasoline, you know. So I acknowledge that. But, you know, when farms are dangerous places for kids, like that's part of the, like, mm. you know, you're talking about Abbott's, bringing people onto the farm. I want to do that. I want to educate. If I didn't become a farmer, I was going to become an art teacher of all mm. things. Um, education has always been a big part of what we've done at Wiley Fox Farm, whether it's customers or other farmers mm. or whoever um i was at one point the you know the president of nofa new york mm. which is you know that's all they're doing is education you know not all they're doing yeah but that's a big part of i forgot about uh, nofa uh, yeah nofa um that was another thing like 
I stepped up to be president of that organization, and I was the first one that was born after 1955 to be the president mm. of that organization. It was the same thing. Was I just want to move this movement into the next step. We don't yeah. have to have holy produce. We don't have to, like, you know, do this or that or the other thing or the way it's always been or any mm. of that stuff, you know. And uh, the first time I gave a speech in front of that organization, you know, there's 500 people in the room or whatever, and I said, the key to the whole organic movement, and I still believe this, is getting people in their backyards mm. to, to garden, mm. you know, because people are like, ah, you can't feed the world, you know. I've heard all the, you know, yeah. all my friends are, you know, still, <laughs> still, uh, you know, conventional farmers <laughs> and uh, family and whatever. And they're like, ah, you can't do this and, blah, and you can't feed the world. And, and really what it comes down to is the way it used to be is the world fed itself a lot. Yeah. And there's always been farmers, but now we're down to like, you know, whatever. Are we at 1% of the population is feeding the rest of the world? And then it's like 1% of that 1% are organic farmers. Hmm. So, you know, we're, we're outnumbered. Yeah. Ah! But uh, it really is. I mean, especially as we I think about um, like artificial intelligence oh, right yeah. now, because it's so, like, especially with like chat GPT, which, you know, I admit like I'm a perpetrator of. I use it every single day, especially uh -huh. in our business. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, and I've heard this recently on a podcast talking about, how like in countries like China, for example, it's all been, it's been so tech for that there's no one, like there's this generation that's grown up without having any hands-on knowledge of like, yeah. or education on how to do, make things or fix things yeah. or do things yeah. and how detrimental <laughs> that is to the country. Yeah. And then I'm, and yeah. I mean, that's kind of where, where we are a little bit, but definitely yeah. where we're headed. I mean, yeah. uh, if you, I'm, I, I, I would hate to think of the percentage of the American population that if you said you have to go plant a garden in your backyard in order to survive, in order yeah. to eat. Green know, side up. That how many of us, myself included, would have zero yeah. understanding. Yeah. You know? No, I mean, that's uh, when Tree and I uh, first started hanging out and she came to the market and was... I'm going to use the word stalking me. Uh, that's a joke that we have between the two of us. Uh, there's a lot of truth there. But um, anyway, when she, you know, she still says to this day, you know, Wiley Fox Farm, you know, people are coming there for the plants, but really what they're coming for is me, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know. And uh, it's that education, you know, I'll, t I'll sit there and talk with anybody mm. for as long as I can. Like if there's a million people in the booth, then obviously I got to <laughs> work the room. But yeah. Thursday mornings, if you come and hang out with me at seven o'clock when I'm getting set up, yeah. you know, Thursday, you know, <laughs> any Thursday in May when I'm sitting there waiting for people to show up, uh, I'll talk to you for the first two hours that I'm there mm. about whatever you want to talk about, you know, yeah. I'm really an open book. And that's, <clears throat> that's a big part of our success too, is just hmm. not only giving you the quality plant to put in the ground, mm -hmm. but how to do it and what to do with it. You know, this year we're going to have probably somewhere around 60 to 70 hmm. medicinal and culinary herbs. Hmm. Also, we're really uh, blowing that up. Tree does a lot of work with, with medicinals and uh, tinctures and, and such. Hmm. And, uh, you know, when you, People will say, hey, can I get this? And I'll say, you know, the best way to get that is to come right to the farm. Mm. Because at market, we have three stalls. We have th literally thousands, maybe 100,000 plants in the stall mm. on, an, on a Saturday morning. But if someone comes in there and buys all of my black creme tomatoes first mm. thing off the bat, which just happens all the time, mm. and then the next 50 people that come in are like, oh, you got any black creams? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I do. They're at home. <laughs> so anyway, I suggest getting to the farm to see mm -hmm. what's going on there and then also have the whole variety of plants, mm. you know, because we can only bring so many plants to market. And yeah. Like if someone buys like all of my black crims or all of my, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and that way you can really see the full list of culinary errors because also like if I have something like rosemary, we're, we grow rosemary from seed, wow. which is nuts. Yeah. 
there's a lot of things I do that are nuts. <laughs> One of the things is grow rosemary from seed. Um, <clears throat> so the rosemary <laughs> plants are like, you know, three quarters of an inch tall. And I say, you know, that's okay. You know, you can buy them from whoever yeah. or whatever. They they got their starts in February from, from uh, I think it's, I want to say uh, you can get a lot of uh, rosemary starts from uh, cuttings from Jerusalem of all places, I think huh. is where they're coming from. Is it because they take so long to grow to yeah. get the size? Yeah. Um, and they need a cold period and this and that and the other thing and, hmm. you know, like parsley, even parsley takes three weeks to germinate mm. under ideal conditions. Mm. Um, so we planted a ton of parsley last week, and those plants, if we're selling them four-inch pots, won't be to size until, I don't know, the end of May, early mm. June. So if you come to the farm and you see that same four-inch pot, it's, it's sitting there in that four-inch pot, mm. you know, three weeks earlier, mm. but I probably won't start bringing them in four-inch pots until they are sizable, Yeah, you know, so... So what is the, I mean, I know, I, I know you all from, uh, I think I know you all, first of all, from Tree, because I followed, because I were connected with Tree from Recess mm -hmm. and from yeah. those days. And then I yeah. saw her started, you know, post more and more about the farm, but, yeah. and then I would yeah. see you at the market and, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But, and, uh, so what is the primary source? Like, is your primary source, um, regional market and, you know, selling the produce and vegetables? Uh, is it selling the plants in the early season? Are you selling to restaurants? Are you growing things for restaurants? <laughs> so that's an interesting uh, thing. You know, in 20 years, we've seen a lot of changes at Wiley Fox Farm. When we first started the farm, I wanted to do a huge CSA. Mm. Like, I wanted to be, like, three or 400 shares and then wow. like a thousand shares was what hmm. my goal was originally. Cause going through NOFA, yeah. you know, going to NOFA conferences, seeing people that were doing that kind of stuff. Hmm. And uh, then as we started doing that, um, we went from like 18 members to let's say 65 members hmm. in one year. And then we bumped up to a hundred and then we decided I just can't stay up all night all the time. Hmm. Like I got to sleep at some point. So I went back to work um, off the farm in 2011, believe it or not, uh, we went cold turkey. We didn't mm. even have our own home garden. Wow. <laughs> Which was crazy, you know. Um, but it had to happen. You know, the evolution of the farm um, has been a wild ride in itself. You know, we mm. – so as many people know, uh, uh, I met my first wife, Maggie, out in California – when I went out there to landscape after I got done hiking, I went to California, started landscaping for just a different kind of millionaire, but mm. you know, Napa and Sonoma Valley all around San Francisco, working for a big company, doing big projects again. Uh, by the time we left California, I was like a project manager running multi, multi-million dollar projects. And basically I was a babysitter mm. and I was an operator. So when we we're putting in big trees. I was the guy that was like running the equipment to, mm to make sure things went smoothly. Um, and when we came back here, we were just kind of like, I want to grow something. She was a landscape architect, uh, working on being a landscape landscape architect, easy for me to say. Um, and then we came back here, we were like, we looked at houses and properties in Skinny Atlas to like maybe do like a wedding venue. Like there was a lot of things being kicked around. And then I went to my first NOFA conference and I was like, eh, this is what I want to do. Hmm. So we, uh, then I did my second hike, um, and when I got back, to, back we, we found the farm in December of 2023, like I said, hmm. um, and then we started to, started to go from there and learn, and like I said, I worked for Dick uh, for a season, and then um, the evolution was, okay, let's start a CSA. So we started the CSA, and that's what we were doing. Hmm. And then it got to be the point where it was hard because we're now at like 100 members mm. and we're trying to figure out how do you grow just enough produce for 100 members without like mm. having too much or too little. And, you know, there's ways to work around that, um, which we did. But it was, mm. it, was, it was becoming obvious that we needed an outlet for, um, you know, if you have a really good year for tomatoes, yeah. we need to get rid of those tomatoes somewhere. So then we started wholesaling and... Uh, we got certified. I fought certification for a long time. 
uh, just for all the political stuff and the hmm. being able to use things that you shouldn't be able to use and whatever, all the politics behind that. Yeah. But we got to the point where we were going to start wholesaling, so we needed uh, needed to to get certified, which we did in 2010, I think, hmm. when we first got certified. Um, so then we moved into, we were doing what we called the Foxy Five. So we'd go set up at Nature Time, and people got the five items that we had the most of. Everybody mm. got that. And then you got a dollar amount off the table mm. to choose. So if somebody wanted, like if there was people that would literally do this that were juicers, mm. and they'd get, they'd fill their all their 20 bucks, and it would all be kale, you know? <laughs> so which is fine, whatever. That's, that's what it's there for. Yeah. Get it out of here. Um, so then uh, in 2011, uh, a couple of things happened. We finally were able to uh, get pregnant. Mm. Took us eight years. I finally figured out what I was doing, I guess. <laughs> and uh, and then Miss Annabelle was on the way. Um, so then when we came back into production, I was a stay-at-home dad. Uh, Maggie had a really great job being a landscape architect. Mm. And, uh, and so I was a stay-at-home dad. So I needed something to do uh, where I didn't have to be on a tractor with a you know four-month-old. <laughs> <coughs> so literally, we... Started growing seedlings. We'd always grown our own seedlings. Hmm. So then we uh, started selling them. The first day at market, I will never forget this as long as I live. I back my F350 pickup truck in. I pull out the you know eight foot table, put some put some uh, trays out on the table, and the the guy <laughs> a couple stalls over said, "Oh, what are you selling there?" I said, "Oh, plants." And then of course he saw the organic on them, and he's like. Organic plants, how much are you going to sell those for? And at the time, it was uh, like three bucks a six-pack, I think. Hmm. And I'll never forget his booming voice down the A-shed going, you'll never get that here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> laughing his ass off. So luckily, Meg Shader from Wake Robin hmm. came over, and she bought a flat, which I think was like 28 bucks or something hmm. at the time. <clears throat> so the rent to be there... It's 35 bucks on a Thursday mm. at the time. And I took home $32. <laughs> so not only did I have to like put all my trays back in my truck mm. in front of this guy who was surely smirking to himself, mm. I also had to go home and tell Maggie that uh, mm. seedlings maybe wasn't going to be what mm. uh, saved the farm. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. And then uh, word started getting out that we had organic plants and they looked good. Mm. And by the end of that season, we did six weeks that year. I think we did uh, six Thursdays and one Saturday. Mm. And we sold every plant we produced Wow! by the end of it. That's um, awesome. And then it really snowballed from there. We're still doing uh, upwards of 20% more every year, mm. which is really insane we have people coming from uh hmm. the new york pennsylvania border out by buffalo farmers that come to get plants specifically from us hmm. all over uh, a couple of years ago we did mail order with a company that wanted to mail order plants uh so we sent plants down to florida up to maine hmm. and as far west as uh, kansas wow um so that was pretty wild and you know, it's just, it's really uh, exciting and humbling at the same time to have people. I have a woman that <laughs> comes every year, and she has a daughter, I think, in Virginia. So she comes and gets her plants and then mm. takes a trip to Virginia and takes her daughter plants because her daughter wants my plants. Mm. And then the next week she comes, and she goes to Boston to take her son plants and our plants in Boston because they want mm. our plants. So it's really... Uh, you know, really satisfying to have people coming from so far away to buy plants from us when there's so many options out there. Um, you know, even at the market, the regional market, there's so many people doing so many wonderful things and and working so hard. And for people to pack our booth uh, on Saturday mornings, you know, like I said, Memorial Day weekend, um, We'll start having people in the booth. At, I've sold plants at 10 after 5 in the morning before when I'm unloading the truck. Hmm. People that wanted a specific thing. And I say, I can't hold anything for anybody. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I'd love to offer that. But it is chaos. 
I mean, it is just chaos trying to get all those plants and all those things onto the trucks. And then the other thing is I can't guard them. Yeah. Like they're like, can't you just keep them in the corner or whatever? I've had, I've put remay, which is like the row cover stuff that protects your plants from bugs and it keeps the temperature warm. I've taken remay and covered plants under tables and had other people come and swipe out from underneath those tables. <laughs> it's like, I can't, I just can't guarantee it. That's hilarious. Well, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on and, and I, um, is I've been t- t- wrestling with the thought of this and, and like what, my role is in, in changing it. But in the past, uh, since COVID, you know, when COVID happened, I wasn't sure what was going to happen to the, like our area, you know, mm-hmm. like what happens to the food culture in the world is different than what happens in central New York. You know, yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. four or five, six years removed. Definitely. Yeah. But, um, and so maybe we're just feeling that maybe it has nothing to do with COVID. I don't know, but it feels like prior to COVID, um, and I've talked to Mark from Farm to Fork 101 about this. Yeah. There is, there is a stronger focus on, um, maybe it's just in my world, I don't know, but stronger focus on quality food yeah. here in central New York. There's a, more of a focus and more of a conversation about uh, great chefs and great restaurants and working with farmers and, you know, the farmers that were producing wonderful food. And, um, you know, I remember being at a dinner with that Cody Dedishu, who you know, I, I would murder someone if it meant that he would get back in a kitchen and open a restaurant. But um, uh, I was at a dinner with Cody where he was, and I had just come off of reading Dan Barber's Third Plate, yeah, he, listening and, and learning <clears throat> about Klaus Martens. And then I go yeah. to a dinner like the next week and Cody's like presenting this bread and, and he's saying, this is grain <laughs> that I went to Pinyan and picked. And I was like, yeah. what? It's like, how do yeah. you know? But so I, fe- I feel like we've gone from that to now we live in a world of 50 cent chicken wings. Yeah. And, um, and I'm desperately trying to, and, and we're going we're to have like another one or two blows to our quality food scene in terms of restaurants coming up later this year that I'm not happy about. But, uh, but so I'm trying to figure out what Eat Local New York's role is in Central New York in terms of trying to bring that conversation back around and even better than it was before, you yeah. know, how to focus in on that. <clears throat> it's, it's really interesting that you say this because I didn't really answer your last question because I started rambling about <laughs> other things. Sorry. I do that. My wife, if, if she was here right now, she'd whack me over the head and tell me to get back on topic. But, uh, I'm sure right now she's sitting in a greenhouse and she's like, God, I wish you'd just talk about what he got asked about. I can tell you right now, that's what's going on. Uh, So anyway, to answer your question, the last question, (laughs) uh, where do we sell our products? So what has happened for us uh, because of COVID is we this year are probably not going to sell a whole lot of wholesale. Hmm. Um, I think uh, so... So I'll go off topic again (laughs) to talk about the evolution of the farm is that when we came back into farming after the year off, um, there I sat at the market. I was a stay at home father and I have Annabelle, my daughter, propped in my arm, feeding her a bottle. Mm. And I have a wad of cash in this hand and I'm just telling people to take the change out Mm. of this hand. And uh, that's how we were back in business. Mm. And that's where the, where it, came from. So at the same time, I'm like fighting with the guy next door telling me that my shit's not worth (laughs) anything. Uh, I'm also dealing with a five month old baby Hmm. in my hands at market, slinging plants as fast as I can. (laughs) So the evolution is we, we started out as a CSA farm. We moved into seedlings Hmm. and then Maggie uh, had breast cancer Hmm. and we fought that fight. And then we actually separated and we dealt with that. And then she actually passed away. Mm. Um, so all of a sudden there I was with a farm and and mm. a single dad. And I had a partner in the mix. And it's pretty wild, man. Mm. I mean, like I said, I've I've seen some seen some <laughs> things in my day. And uh, you know, as we came back out of that, like, you know, I, I'll never forget we went to uh I took her to um Boston to uh, try some some uh, experimental drugs and things. Mm. And we, I got back at like 1 o'clock in the morning. 
it was going to be 60 degrees. This was the last weekend in April and our leases don't start, but we can still go, mm -hmm. you know? So I get back at one o'clock in the morning. I sleep for like 20 minutes. I get up, I go, <laughs> load the truck. And then we go to market the next morning. And there I am like trying to figure out how to deal with death hmm. and how to take care of my daughter how to deal with my girlfriend because Maggie and I are separated. Mm. Some crazy shit, man. Just yeah. some crazy shit. And, uh, you know, then, then we sell, it's like April 26th or whatever, mm. and we sell 350 tomato plants. <laughs> and I'm like, man, what is going on in this world where, <laughs> like, you know, mm. it, it's just, it was crazy, you know, just crazy stuff going on. So then we evolved into like that's what we were doing, and then you know we dealt with Maggie passing and uh, all that that entailed, and uh, just trying to keep our feet under us, you know, trying to keep grounded and hmm. and uh, realize you know there's the farm and the the life and 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 all the all the diversity that goes along with all of that, and then you come back out of that. And I got to make some money. So I'm working for someone else on their farm growing mm. hemp. Mm. You know, the first couple of years, I probably was involved with growing more hemp than anybody in the state, mm. which is another whole wild thing <laughs> where I'm like staying up all night drying hemp and then going into the field with the crew, mm. you know, the only bilingual person <laughs> in the crew, you know, like <laughs> it's a good life. Yeah. You know, like that's all I can say about it too is like that's the positive flow of 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 who i am and mm -hmm. who wiley fox farm is too as a result of that is is flowing so there i am standing up all night drying hemp <laughs> and then getting up in the you know staying up taking the crew into the field driving all this big equipment you know mm -hmm. my buddy's got you know it's like hundreds of horsepower tractors mm -hmm. versus my 25 horsepower tractor <laughs> so doing all this crazy stuff and then coming back into farming full swing um you know, and, and obviously meeting Tree and, and having her become a part of the equation and her, you know, her two two kids. <laughs> and uh, sorry to get emotional, but, you know, it, it is still, there's still a lot, you know, yeah. there's still a lot going on. So the evolution now is Tree came into my life in 2019 and, uh, mm. you know, just the beginning of vegetable season, um, and we start, I'm still doing the hemp thing full time. So we're not even growing vegetables in 2019 mm. for real. And then 2020, we swing back into full vegetables in mm. the middle of the pandemic. Wow. She had with, you know, with the boys from recess, you know, open cure. Yeah. Um, three weeks before the pandemic <laughs> hit. So then we're trying to figure out how to keep that afloat. And mm. we're, you know, marketing the farm. We're marketing cure. We're like doing all these things, three kids that are like, <laughs> you know, we got three kids within 18 months of each other. <laughs> One of which our son has, uh, you know, quite, quite a bit of disability. So we, mm -hmm. we juggle that all the time. So as we evolved back into full production on, on the, uh, on the vegetables mm -hmm. in the middle of COVID, you have all these restaurants that are struggling mm -hmm. and I fully understand and support their decisions to like get more organic stuff off the Cisco truck. Yeah. They just have to, right. You know, like they're getting killed. Yeah. And, uh, so that's when we really started moving back into retail, hmm. you know, one of the big parts of our equation early, uh, like 2014, 2015, um, while we're battling cancer is wholesaling through farm shed, Neil Miller, hmm. uh, running farm shed. I was one of me and Darren mom were one of his first, uh, you know, farmer connections. Hmm. So we're selling like whatever, $50,000 of wholesale, hmm. um, vegetables, uh, to like New York city, all around here, Ithaca, like wherever he could reach out and make that connection for us. Hmm. Um, we had a great partnership there. Um, so now last year we did less than a thousand dollars of wholesale, uh, produce sales. Wow. And the difference was like in 2000, let's say 2015, when I'm stopping at, you know, Green Planet and the food co-op and, you know, whatever mm. restaurants and, you know, stopping along, I'm dropping like 
five boxes, six, seven, eight, ten boxes of produce to like most of those places. Mm -hmm. And now like 2020, we're like dropping one box, mm. you know, or two boxes or, you know, whatever. And part of that too, is there's just so many wonderful farmers out there right now yeah. too, you know, doing such amazing work, mm -hmm. you know? So there's some competition factor, the COVID factor, like every chef in a restaurant, when they move, you know, restaurants, like, you know, the restaurant business, right. you know, the chef's there for a year and then they start fighting with the owner and yeah. <laughs> whatever the story is. So then you're like following the chef around or the new chef comes into an account that you had that was really good for you. And then all of a sudden that chef's gone and you're just like flat yeah. on your face. Like, can you buy? Well, I already buy from so-and-so and this, and I yeah. got this connection to the, huh. you know, whatever yeah. the Hudson Valley or some other thing that's going on. So those are the so it's so it's always moving. So yeah. to answer your question, right now, we are selling plants to uh, Hafners. They buy. They've been buying from us for the mm -hmm. last few years because uh, they don't do their own yeah. certified organic line. So they've been buying plants from us, and then most of it's through the regional market. Mm -hmm. We're there from the last week in April or May first, depending on what the weather's doing to us. Right through Christmas, the last mm -hmm. three years, we've gone. Uh, uh, you know, 2021 20, and 22, we've gone right till the weekend before Christmas with produce. Mm. Wow. Um, I love the cold, so I'd <laughs> much rather be picking vegetables at 38 <laughs> degrees. You know, before I hate the frost, yeah, but that 38 degree mark, <laughs> man, I love it. I yeah. love being out there with the stars <laughs> over my head picking kale at four o'clock in the morning. You know, <laughs> nothing makes me happier. I come in and it's <laughs> it's tough on the rest of the family yeah. because when I come back in to wake them up. I'm like on fire. I've been up for three or four hours, and then I'm like, hey, how about these cold hands on your back? And you know, daughter's screams here and I'm like, hey how about <laughs> oh it pisses Sorry, them well, off but, yeah, but whatever awesome. so yeah so uh, so the evolution to answer your second question <laughs> now i've got the first one out of the way now the second one is you're right like covid really did some some bad things to restaurant mm -hmm. you know businesses obviously there's a lot of restaurants that shut down during the covid there's a lot of farmers that were trying to sell to those restaurants and they lo no longer can because that that market's just gone yeah so this year we're really mm -hmm. uh concentrating on the regional market yeah. and then farm sales we actually last year built uh an addition to our washroom that mm -hmm. is going to be our farm store that's cool so we're pretty excited about that we had a lot of people that would show up at market that said hey can we buy produce at the farm we're like oh, we're not really set up for that and it's because they come from weed sport or jordan or further out like Wolcott. yeah They're like we only come to the regional market like once every month or once every six weeks but we'd love to support you guys so hmm. so yeah look for the uh look for produce uh at the farm this year we're really excited about that yeah. Um, and then, like I said, Tree's doing a lot of stuff with uh, medicinals and drying yeah. herbs and yeah. and stuff like that. So that, that's, that's really cool. cool. Yeah. 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 Mm. So that all being right. said, like all of our, you know, we have such a connection to the community, even, res you know, restaurants that aren't buying as much produce from us or whatever, we're still doing like on farm, like Rich, you know, yeah. uh, he does a hell of a job. We were lucky enough to be his first, uh, you know, awesome. on farm uh, extravaganza a few years back. And then, like you said, you mentioned Mark with Farm to Fork. He's, yeah. uh, you know, he gives me a call about every week or two, just, <laughs> just asking questions or what do you think about this? And, you know, everything right down to like Abigail Henson. Yeah. Like she's like my little sister. Yeah. Um, you know, I know you, she's been on the podcast with mm -hmm. you, and um, she's doing great stuff over at the market, and also up at Hafner's too. She's connected yeah. up there. Yeah, so. yeah, it's um, it's definitely something. I I, I don't know exactly how we're gonna do it. Um, I know like we're coming out with a list of um, seventy six best restaurants that we're gonna release in July, and not mm -hmm. that I think that that's like anything earth shattering, but we're just trying to like make the conversation. A, one, we're trying to make one a part of the conversation about the restaurants that we know are doing great things with food, yeah, and um, and not the ones that are just kind of like, and not that there's, I mean, everybody's got to make a dollar, I get it, but not the restaurants that are buying just buying something from Cisco or yeah. wherever and just kind of you know going for it, but somebody who's, um, and not that a great restaurant is only a restaurant that buys from a local farm, but. There's people that are doing great things with food. So we're going to do that. We're, we're talking about kind of like a mini 
good food festival of just inviting those chefs and restaurants that are doing really great things. Yeah, that's um, awesome. But yeah, and there's a couple other things I need to talk to you off the air. So. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I think that Syracuse, we're really, really lucky to be where we're at with the food thing because, you know, you can go to Manhattan and get really great food and you pay, you know, you can't afford the mortgage the next month. Yeah. And we have so many people doing such great things. You know, I mentioned, you know, Eden. Yeah. And everything that he's doing over there, you know, I'd, I'd go and sit and watch, you know, sit at, a, sit at the bar and, you know, just watch him work. It's yeah. amazing. You know, I set up at our places a couple of times now where he just, <laughs> the first time he brought a wagon, the second time he brought some cinder blocks and a, <laughs> you know, and a grill and we just threw it, threw this together in the back corner behind our greenhouses. <laughs> it was like 95 degrees that day. We we're like, just, we were hovering on the fence row, yeah. you know, just dying for the heat for the sun to go down that <laughs> night. It was, but it was awesome. We had an awesome, another awesome night, uh, huh. you know, with Rich and, yeah. and his crew. He's got a great crew there too. It's so. you know, yeah. Well, I'll leave this that last comment I was going to make for off air. So, well, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I you appreciate bet. it. I mean, sorry, uh, sorry to avoid your questions. It wasn't, not uh, at it wasn't all. on purpose. <laughs> this was a very different conversation than, or you know, uh, than I thought that we were going to have, yeah. and I'm more than okay with that. This was yeah. a, a great welcome for me. So, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we uh, we we got a lot going on. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've always had a lot going on. I I plan to always have a lot going on. Uh, tree often says it'll be me and the cockroaches at the end of the world because <laughs> I just uh, we just got to keep going. You know, yeah. I mean, as as kind of a final thing, uh, working into my own uh, kind of spirituality and mortality. Mm. You know, you can, you, you know, like I said, I've been very lucky. I had a lot of opportunities put in front of me mm. and t- have taken a lot of, a, you know, a lot of positivity out of those. Even like. You know, when Maggie passed, um, mm. there's a, a, a sense of an enlightenment, you know, being there and, you know, holding her hands as she passed mm. um, and taking that forward and, and using that energy uh, to, you know, be a part of the community mm. and be somewhat of a foundational rock. A lot of people call me mm. the rock, their rock. Mm. And, um, you know, that's part of, like, the whole food movement is, like you're saying, the best 76 restaurants. And, you know, we could do a list of farmers like that mm-hmm. and a list of, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. mechanics. But being that foundation and having integrity um, and doing the things that need to do socially, economically, financially for yourself yeah. to do better in the world do better for the world um i think that that's we're really on a on a great path i'm hmm. really glad that tree has come into my life yeah and we can work on some of those things together and hmm. um just be better human beings hmm. be better farmers hmm. be be better consumers yeah. you know hmm. our family is also consumers like when we go out we do <laughs> try and find some local stuff when tree and i run away from the farm. We'll go to like Buffalo. We were just in Buffalo a month and a half ago and we're like seeking out. We'll like have, we'll stop at like 10 different places Mm. to have like a donut here (laughs) and a beef on wick here. Yeah. And then we have a beer over here Mm -hmm. and then we have this over there, you know, like just right down the, right down the list of all the wonderful food, you know, Mm. of Buffalo, of Syracuse, Rochester, you know, Mm. Utica. I mean, we'll go to these little small towns and, you know, just look for, <laughs> look for those foundations of the community. Yeah. They're doing all that wonderful work. And whether that's a coffee house, that's also a bookstore, that's also a yoga studio, that's also like mm. where you can get your fingernails done for the prom or mm-hmm. whatever the thing is. Like those are the businesses that we have to support. Yeah. You know, we have to across the board. Um, I don't care if you're the biggest redneck or you're the most <laughs> woke ass person walking <laughs> around, like, Everybody's got to support that local stuff because hmm. it's the foundation of yeah of our whole community, hmm. you know, and that's what we're losing. That's you know, like you said, we want to circle back to that. Yeah. Like COVID really f some things up, but you know, like I really believe that the human spirit is going to find the positive, and we can move forward from those foundational businesses mm-hmm. and people. Yeah. 
That's great. That's my clip for the podcast. That's my that's my marketing. There you go. Right there. there you go. Market it. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Yeah, you bet.